Give Jesus praise for who he is and what he does. Come on, just give him thanks for every changed life. Isn't he something? I pray that when you look at that, you will see the faces of your sons and daughters that you are believing for because those are kids that somebody, some mother or dad has been praying for. So let that give you faith that he answers prayers. And I, and I believe what God is doing there, come on, he's going to do here in Jesus' name. Let it be a great awakening. Father, raise up an army of youth in this Baskin Ridge region in Jesus' name that will sweep for this, across the state of New Jersey. I pray for an awakening in the youth of New Jersey, New York, this region, Lord. I pray a stirring, fiery passion in every single one of them. God, let them experience the real Thing. We believe you tonight, God. We ask you in faith, Lord, send an awakening to New Jersey, to the youth of this region. Arise, army of God, in Jesus' name. Be awakened, army of God, in Jesus' name. If you agree, give God praise that says, yes, God, let it be in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So pray for us, come and see us, bring your youth group, bring your kids, and uh, be transformed with us. I get saved every conference, I think. No, I'm serious. It's, it's truly an experience. We have a two-year school of ministry that these kids come afterwards, and there it's just God is doing something special. Hallelujah. What a day to be alive. I've come on a mission, and I've come to encourage you. I know that I prayed and asked God to send who he wanted this weekend and on this, for this afternoon, and he sent you for a reason. So um, my goal tonight, or this afternoon, is to encourage you that you, now you already believe, but I'm just declaring over you, believe again. To have an awakening of just fresh hope. And as Pastor Tricia said a few moments ago, a new strength. You and I agree. When you walk out of here this afternoon, you're going to have that. Fresh faith, an awakened hope, and renewed strength. Amen? I'm going to get right to the point because I don't have any time to waste. So let me just refresh you on why I believe God brought me. I love your mission, believing for I love when you change prodigals to promised ones, these promises that are out there. When I walked in and listened to you praying over your sons and daughters, believing and praying them home, oh, this is the first church I've ever walked into that was doing that when I walked in. So you know what that tells me? You better get room to make room in this place for these. When these kids all come home, you talk about an instant awakening and revival over this region. Come on, instant. I mean, family revival. During the years of 2014 and 15, I experienced in my life a journey of intercession that changed the way I think, the way I pray, and the way I live. It resulted in me being eyewitness to the greatest miracle that I have ever personally witnessed. And I have seen tremendous and wonderful miracles and the Lord has blessed me to be able to serve in his ministry for 40 years in full-time ministry. This past year was my 40th year of full-time ministry. But seeing this firsthand, it was as though I saw the dead come back to life. I felt like Martha just going around. You know, Martha probably didn't want to talk about anything else for the rest of her life except the day she saw her brother walk out of that tomb. That's what I felt like. And so for those of you today that are in that similar situation, um, I just I want you to find hope and um, renewed faith in, for my story. As I told you, I have two daughters. Uh, they were raised in the ministry with me this, this whole journey. Uh, they've known nothing but the presence of God. I carried both of those girls ministering on the platform. And Lauren can tell you from day one, They've known nothing but just the atmosphere of his presence, prayer, church, the word. Come on, I mean, I mean, they are actually, I'm fifth generation Pentecostal in my family. They're sixth generation. So, I mean, it's like it goes back a ways, right? 
So to have this testimony that I'm going to share today, I never dreamed that this would be a part of the testimony I would ever be sharing. Uh, Lauren and Lindsay not only were traveling with me as, as from the time they were born in, in, uh, when I was traveling alone and ministering, speaking, singing, but when we began the ramp, they were right there beginning the ramp with me in just forming the actual being a part of the very DNA of it. They both fell in love with young men whose lives were also transformed at the ramp. Samuel, Lauren's husband, he was saved and delivered through the ministry there. Lindsay married a young man named Casey who was from uh, just sort of about 20 minutes maybe out of Hamilton, sort of a little deeper in the woods, a place called Brilliant, Alabama. And Casey just had a special anointing on his life the first time I ever saw that young man I thought God's going to do something with this boy well did he ever and he married my daughter and I was happy about it so they were actually Casey and Lindsay ended up being the pastors of ramp church we formed a church Casey ended up becoming the director of the ramp school of ministry Lindsay was over all things performing arts the dance team you see on there Lindsay was the choreographer she was just in the middle of it all and Lindsay's just the most unlikely person to even be about this story because Lauren can tell you she's the sanguine in the family. She might have come by it a little honestly, but whatever. But Lindsay is just loves everybody. If Lindsay were in here today, she'd be walking around wanting to hug your neck and, and just get to know you and just talk your ear off. That's Lindsay. She's sort of the life of the party girl. But loved God and, and was walking with the Lord. But Lindsay was targeted by the enemy. And little by little, drop by drop, he began to deceive her mind. Unbeknownst to me, under the radar, while we're all over here ministering, there was something going on in Lindsay's mind that begins to pull her away from her family, from her marriage. She, by that time, had two little girls, my two grandchildren. And uh, before I knew it, Lindsay had turned into someone we didn't even know. And um, we, we could see these subtle changes. We were talking about it. You know, what in the world is going on with her? Spring of 14, Lindsay comes out, comes in and, and announces to the family that uh, she is divorcing her husband, Casey, the pastor of the church, with no biblical grounds whatsoever, a man of God, that we knew we walked with him intimately in relationship close. She's divorcing her husband. She is leaving the ministry. She moves to a different city eventually and just turns into someone else. It was, and I've been through some stuff, and you have too. We all have those stories, don't we? But that was the hardest thing I've ever walked through in my life. It's one thing, and I've dealt with some stuff in my own life, but when you mess with your kids, that's more, that's worse than what, than you. You love your kids more than you love yourself. At least I call normal mothers. I think they do, right? And in, in that season, it was, here we are. We have, you know, students in our school. We've got all these conferences. You've got all this ministry going on. All this life is going on all around you. And literally, I felt like my world had caved in. And, you know, for me... My children are more important to me than all this ministry stuff. And here I am still trying to do this stuff, but at the same time knowing I've got this huge decision to make. I've got to determine how I'm going to deal with this situation that's going on in my life and in our family. I was, I was being told by good, well-meaning ministry friends who began to be concerned about me and just the, you know, the trauma of the whole event. And, and they, they meant well. But I remember them saying to me on numerous occasions, and not just one, but several in their concern and in their counsel, I remember them saying, Karen, Lindsay is a grown woman. You cannot control her life. You're going to have to let her go. You're going to have to accept this. 
and somehow find a way to move on with your life. Karen, you can't let this destroy your life too. You've got to find a way to move on with your life. You've got to find a way to accept this. And that was just a huge part of the, of the battle in the beginning days of the storm was, was in, in my own mind just thinking, you know, I've served God my whole life. And, and loved God my whole life. And is this really the way it is? I remember battling with that in my own house, just thinking, really? I mean, is, 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 does it all really boil down to that? That, that all the stuff we preach about God and the God that can do anything and, and the great big God, that we all that we sing about, we, and yet Satan has just walked into my house, stolen what means more to me than anything in this world, and I have got to just accept that and just sit down over here and try to figure out some way to just go on with my life? Is that really the way this thing works? I remember thinking to myself, because when I look at my daughter and when I look at the situation all around her, there is nothing in that picture that looks like the will of God. Nothing. In fact, when I looked at Lindsay, I remember thinking to myself, what I see is what Jesus said Satan does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So here's my decision. I could do this. I can either accept that, which is obviously not the will of God, or I can go straight to this God that I have known and loved and served. And I can say to God, God, what do you have to say about this right here, God? What do you have to say about this picture with my daughter? Because the truth is, what he has to say about it is the final answer. It's the beginning and the end and everything in the middle. All that matters is what he had to say. So this was my decision. I decided I'm going to stand right here in this place. I'm not going to go sit down on the couch and accept this and move on with my life in ministry. I'm going to stand right here in this place until that thing looks like that word. Come on. That was my final answer. Now, for me, that was a turning point. Because I had to make up my mind, and, and, and it's what happened. My whole world shut down. Everything revolved around that focus. I knew, I knew I'm a wife. I still had to do, you know, be, be a wife. I still have to minister the best that I can. I've still got children. I've got grandchildren. So I had to live life the best I could. But I'm telling you on the priority of my, the priority of my focus, everywhere I went. Come on, I didn't even go to Walmart without, Paul said, pray without ceasing. That's what I did. I was at Walmart. I, I, in fact, at Walmart, so I could keep praying the whole time, I would just hold my cell phone to my ear like this. And I just, the whole time I was in there getting groceries, I was on my phone with God. I knew he was on the other end and I just kept talking to him while I was in the store. I wouldn't have to talk to anybody else that way. And I just keep talking to God. Come on. I made up my mind, my whole world, night and day, night and day. Sometimes praying till the sun came up in the morning. I just go to the ramp and sometimes bring a pillow and a blanket if necessary. And I would just be determined. I'm going to be in this place until, until I get the release tonight. That's just the way it's going to be. That's just the way it's going to be. And unrelenting. I just, I like to say it. I've just made up my mind. I've just made up my mind. I made up my mind. And when you go to God and you get his word on it, that's what changes everything. Let me, let me, this is not exactly a disclaimer to my statement that you don't have to accept anything. It's not the will of God. But let me add to that statement something that is important. Let me say, there, that statement is true. There are, though, some situations that, let me put it this way. I don't like to box God in to anyone's theology. Anyone. I think he's bigger than anything we can fathom. And there are sometimes circumstances. I'll give you an example. I have a good friend. She lost her daughter at five years of age. 
Was that the will of God? I mean, sometimes there's no answers for things when we do not understand. And I, I just like to put this over here and say, you know, the truth is people that come through those places and they do not understand and they have no answers, but they can still look up and say, I don't understand, but I trust you and I worship you at the end of it all. To me, that's the highest form of faith that there is. To me, that's the highest form of worship I know. And even Hebrews speaks of those people in Hebrews 11. You've, you've got the column up here of the Abrahams and the Sarahs and the Gideon and the, all these people that are amazing, saw the miraculous. And then he says, and there were others who were tortured and beaten. And, and he describes all that they went through. And I love his last statement about those people. He said, of whom the world was not worthy. So faith can look like different things. And I want you to know, to just honor those people who have walked in that place, your faith mattered and will be rewarded. It was not for loss. It will be for a gain beyond anything you've imagined. My word tonight is for those who are in a situation, as I was in, where my daughter is in a place where it is not the will of God she is living and she is living against his purpose and going in absolute rebellion against his will I'm talking to people who like me have a word from God about that thing now here's the deal I want to encourage you in this because this is the good thing when you get a word from God about your loved one it's everything you need it would you know with God just one word would be enough but he'll give you as many as you need. All the more reason why it's so important to know the will of God. If, if you don't have to accept anything that's not the will of God, then you need to know what is the will of God. That's why I love 1 John 5. Oh, I love this verse. It says this, watch. And this is the confidence that we have in him. Watch. That if we ask anything... According to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we will have whatever we have asked for. Y'all, yeah. that's, that's game changer. Yeah. I love that. That's saying when you know the will of God, it gives you confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, we can have whatever we've asked. Yeah. In other words, when you know the will of God, it changes how you pray. You won't pray wimpy. You won't pray, you won't pray little pansy prayers. You won't be whining when you pray. You don't, you don't, when you know you've got a word, you pray boldly. You pray with confidence. Come on, that's the kind of people he wants in his throne room. That's why he says, walk boldly into my throne room. Come on. Not with your head down whining. Not just praying like, Lord Jesus, if it be your will. Lord God, just help us, God. Lord just Jesus, Jesus, God, help us. Lord Jesus, God. No, no, no. When you pray the will of God, then you walk into the throne room of God. And you know that you've already gone. God is word on the matter. And you're just there to say, Holy Ghost, I'm here to agree with you. You know what that means? That's when God finds somebody that becomes that conduit of faith on the earth. And they're there to pull his will from heaven through them into the earth to manifest his will on the earth as it is in heaven. Come on, do you believe that? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a God. Oh, the thing is, too often we take a passive approach to the challenging circumstances we're facing. There are too many people that just sit there and got to accept it and go on. No, that's just that passive approach. And listen, that passivity comes at a great price. 
Oh, yes, it does. Because watch, when you pray, it matters. Watch, and when you don't pray, it matters. I remember a while back, somebody said this statement, and it just sent my head spinning. They were actually in a conversation with me. I didn't even address it when they said it, but I went home, and I couldn't get it off my mind. They said, you know, they were talking about something else in their life. They just said, well, you know, God is God. If he's God and it's his will, it's going to happen. Whatever God wills is going to happen. Nothing we can do about it will ever change it. If God wills it, that's the way it's going to be. Well, I just looked at him. And I just could not stop thinking about that statement. And so many people think that way. If it's God's will, it's going to happen. Nothing we can do to ever change it. Really? If that's the case, if God is who many people think he is, why pray? Since God is sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent, he's going to do what he wants to do anyway, why should we bother to pray? He already knows what we need before we ask. So why ask? What does he say in James 4, 2? You have not. Why? What? Let's just say this door right here is the will of God about a situation in your life. In my life. This, is, this door represents God's will. In fact, this door is going to represent, let's just say, his, this door is going to represent a door that's going to open into his will for me. So I'm needing that door to open. And it's his will for it to open. So here I am. I've got the door. I've got his word. It's his will for it to open. I know, I know that's a good thing. It's God's will. So why, he's in, why doesn't he just open the door? Right? I mean, God knows I need that door open. He knows I need it open. But just him knowing it is not enough. Yeah. Just walking around saying, God knows. God knows. Of course he knows, but it's not enough that he knows. He hasn't set it up that way that he knows. He knows it all. He knows I need that door open. So why didn't he just open the door? Why is it that the opening of this door is governed by my knocking? Why is it the opening of this door which is his will, is governed by, according to his word, my intercession and my prayer. Yeah. Knock, ask, seek. Wow. Why? That's God's idea. Think about this. These questions began to stir in me when Lindsay was gone. Oh, how they did. And I ran across a little statement John Wesley made that turned my world upside down. I still haven't got over it. And I think about it probably every day still. This was his statement. John Wesley said, God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer. Y'all. Right. Right. Just say la. God does nothing in the earth except in response to prayer. When I first heard that, I wasn't even sure I agreed with it. I was thinking, you know, nah, I don't know about that. I mean, he's God. And, and he can do whatever he wants, right? I just couldn't, just couldn't really swallow that. Then I began to kind of realize why I didn't think I liked it. Because I didn't like the responsibility that put on me. Because, you know, it's a lot easier to blame God. than to think you have anything to do with anything. Then I began to, as I meditated on this for actually months, another thought came into my mind. I began to realize, and this is not just a thought. It's, it's a truth. It really is a truth. At least it is for me as I pondered it. It appears that being said, the result of that statement means to me that God restrains his own desires in order to co-labor with man. Think about it. 
God restrains his own desires in order to co-labor with man. Well, what do you mean by that? Okay, let's just look at this. I want you to think about this with me. Think about who God is. Y'all, he's the God of the universe. This huge, this, this God that, 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 in fact, this, this massive universe that is continuing to explode as we speak at the power of his word, let there be light. It's just still bang and still booming. Here it's still going. Trillions and beyond comprehension, galaxies and stars and whoa and all. And yet, the truth is, God does not even exist in the universe. That universe exists in God. He even says that with the span of his hand, he set the heavens. Y'all, he's something else. He knows each star by name. Each star, he knows, and there are more stars in heaven. I'm big into this, so I love it. There are more stars in heaven than there are grains of sand on every seashore on the earth. He knows by name. Keeps it all spinning and all together, holding it all together on just the power of his word. You look at that. Here we are out here just dangling on nothing but his word. Here, just God. And you look at that God, and then you look at the woes of our little world, of our little dot called earth, and all the problems we deal with, all the problems of the nations, all the problems in our cities. all the. And look, when you look at what our problems are, and then you look at this God, it's not like that God would not know what to do with the problems on our earth. It's not like he looks at our problems and goes, oh, oh, oh. They have got me on this one. They have got me on that one. It's, I mean, and really, it is, it's the question of even the, 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 the secular minds that are out there. I was in an Uber a while back in Europe, actually, and this Uber driver, I was trying to kind of witness to him a little bit, and, and I was trying to throw some word at him and trying to check out where he was, and he wasn't in a good place. And I remember I was trying to talk to him, and he said, well, if there is a God, he said, then why does he allow all the suffering with children. Why does he allow the suffering in Syria? Why does he just, just goes off? Of course, that's what so many people say. If there's a God, then why is there so much suffering in the world? It's a great question. It's a great question. Unless the answer is found in Matthew 16, 19. Behold, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Now, y'all, that's just too much to think about. Hey, that is just too much to think about. What if that's true? And it is. It's red letter. When you look at the problems of our world, in fact, throw my, throw my picture up. The question. I saw this on my Instagram feed one day. I couldn't get over it. I want to ask God why he allows poverty, famine, and injustices in the world when he could do something about it. But I'm just afraid he might just ask me the same question. Just leave it there. Leave it sitting there. Right there. Come on. Behold, I give to you the keys. Come on, y'all. Of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Dear God, come on, y'all. Think about the responsibility this puts on us. The privilege that it puts on us to co-labor with God. It's beyond our comprehension. In other words, the truth is, the, the truth is, it was God's idea to, to create man, not only for fellowship, and relationship because God wanted to love. God is love. And God wanted to love. And God wanted to be loved. So he created men to fellowship, to, to, to have that intimacy with him, but also to co-labor with him in his will on the earth. Y'all think about this. Go here with me in your mind. In other words, when God sees a need in a city, God looks down at Baskin Ridge. And God sees the injustice he's taking. God sees the need. He sees the abuse of the city. God's not going to look at Baskin Ridge tonight and go, I've got to go down there. I've got to take care of that. No, God came to the earth one time. 
in the flesh through his son Jesus Christ to do whatever it took so that he could look at you and me and say now through his blood his word his name I'm giving you everything you need to live in authority and victory in this earth in this life do you believe that so when God looks at Baskin Ridge now, he's not coming back to the earth in the flesh to take care of the problem. No, he's going to start looking. That's why the word says, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro, searching the whole earth, just looking for someone he can show himself mighty through. Come on, when he hits Baskin Ridge, I want him to find you. I want him to find me saying, God, you can get through me, God. According to Ezekiel 22, the Bible says that, that he's, Israel has sinned. They're going to reap destruction. It was not God's will for them to re reap destruction. It was not God's will for them to reap destruction. So what did he do? I, I looked for a man. I looked for somebody. I was looking for somebody who might stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And then the Bible says he found none. And so the land was destroyed. So what my friend said was not true. Just because God wills something to happen. They say it's going to happen. Nothing we can do can change it. Really? Because the word says he's not willing that any would perish. But are people perishing? He says in his word, he's, his will is above all things that would prosper and be in health. Are people in, are sick and, and needy and in lack and in want? And Are they? That's not his will. He does not desire that. So could it be that his will is not being done in the earth because there are no intercessors to contend for it? Except in Baskin Ridge there are. And they're going to make all the difference. Are you still with me tonight? Can I just, I'm going to head toward the end of my road, but will you stay with me till I get there? I'm heading that way. I see it in sight. But just stay with me a minute. Y'all, this is. Even thinking today as I was putting more thoughts in my mind, just revisiting all these things of my own journey, I just began to think again fresh, Lord, Lord, this privilege in prayer, it's no wonder Satan fights prayer probably more than anything else in your life. Because the authority, the power to move and change things for those that become intimate with God and become his friend, it's mind-boggling. And the thing about it, the thing about it is those people. How old are you, son? How much? Thirteen. What is your first name? I'm sorry? Divine? Did I get it right? Divine or Devon? Divine. I like that name. <laughs> Divine, it doesn't matter that you're 14, right? 14, 13, 13. It doesn't matter, 13. He'll take anybody. It doesn't matter how old you are. 13, how old are you, son? 15. 15 year olds, he'll take you right now. He'll take you. He just, he's just looking for intercessors. He's looking for somebody that can, and the deal is, anybody can pray. You don't have to have all the theology understood, you don't have to have the degree in it. Come on, you can talk and communicate with God. This is amazing. The privilege of this, the privilege of becoming, hey, through the blood of Jesus, through the power of his name and his son, that we have the privilege of becoming the friend of God. The friend of God. It's not according to social status or education or no, no. anybody. A friend of God. I love it. It's why I love to study Abraham. And Moses, people that became known as, even identified in the Bible as friends of God. Whoa. Y'all, they blow my mind. Abraham and Moses show us something about the ways of God that we can learn from. In fact, I love this. Psalms 103, catch this. It says about Moses, whoa. It says about Moses, he says, he says, God sh sh revealed his acts to the children of Israel, but his ways he revealed to Moses. For Moses and for Abraham, they found out something about God. They didn't just see the outer display of his power, which was pretty magnificent. No, they understood him well enough as a friend to know his heart, to know why he did what he did. 
Oh, but it doesn't even stop there. Whoa. As Abraham and Moses, you can tell this in their interactions with him. They dug into God enough as a friend and just searching him out and just seeking him, not just for what he could do for him. No, they found out something about this God that he would be reveal himself to them. They kept searching his heart out until they found hidden inside of his heart an endless well of his mercy that was actually actually even something his mercies that would overcome even his judgments oh, oh no i have to show you it's too good i can't i just can't i'm gonna have to read you something oh this is one of my favorite interactions watch watch abraham let me look it up where is it it's in genesis abraham and god talking one of my favorites ever so again God looks down, the city in destruction and sin. God's not, God is not going to just, you know, go fix the problem. He's looking for someone, right? Oh, he's got a friend on the earth. It's not like in Ezekiel he couldn't find anybody. With this situation with Sodom and Gomorrah, oh, he found a friend. So I love this. So the Lord himself comes down to talk to his friend in person. Oh, Selah. So watch. In verse 17, he says of Genesis, he says, Should I hide my plan from Abraham? For Abraham will certainly, and he goes on talking about Abraham. So verse 20, so the Lord told Abraham, I've heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I'm going to go down and see if their actions are as wicked as I've heard. And if not, I want to know. Now watch. So verse 23, Abraham approaches him and he starts talking to the Lord. And Abraham says, watch his statement. First statement to the Lord, to the Lord. Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you would not do such a thing. Destroying the righteous along with the wicked? Why, you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? I mean, if I were walking by Abraham, I'd be like, you going with him, I'm going to go over here. I mean, I mean, Lord, I mean, just the boldness of it. No, the only reason, reason he can talk like this to God, he's got some friendship going on. He already knows. No, no, no. He already knows that place of mercy. Abraham is just, come on, he's just weaving himself down into that place he knows he can find of the heart of God. And the Lord replies, if I find 50 righteous in Sodom, I'll spare the entire city. Abraham says, since I've begun, let me speak further to my Lord, even though I'm but dust and ashes. That was wise. Suppose there's only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Would you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? The Lord says, I'll not destroy it if I find 45. Abraham pressed further. Suppose there's only 40. I'll not destroy it for 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord. Let me speak. Suppose there's only 30, 30 righteous people if they're found. I'll not destroy it for 30. Abraham said, since I've dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there's only 20. I'll not destroy it for 20. Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me. But can I just speak one more time? Suppose there's only ten. And the Lord said, I'll not destroy it for ten. And Abraham stopped. And so did the Lord. But I believe, this is just my personal. If Abraham had have just said one more. Yeah. Suppose there's only one. I personally believe a city would have been spared. One more. Just one more. Moses, it's too good. What time is it? Am I okay? I'm, I'm trying to hurry. Watch. Moses blows me away. You know the story already. The children of Israel have sinned. They've just gotten across the, you know, the creek. And they, uh, they've built the idol. And God is so angry. So it says, so the Lord tells Moses, quick, go down the mountain. I love this. The people that you brought up out of the land of Egypt corrupted themselves how quickly they've turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They've melted down gold and made a calf and they bowed down and sacrificed to it. They're saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now notice this statement from God. Now leave me alone. 
so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I'll destroy them and make you into a nation. That is unreal to me. God is so angry with the children of Israel, he looks at Moses and God already knows how he is with his friends. God already knows, Moses, if you start talking, I already know what's going to happen. So I'm so angry. Moses, leave me alone. So I can do against these people what I'm wanting to do. But not an intercessor. Moses already knew too much about that well of his mercy. Moses comes back, but Lord. In fact, verse 11 says he tries to pacify the Lord, his God. He says, Lord, why are you so angry with your people who you brought out of the land of Egypt? Don't you love that? Don't you love that interaction? Whoa. Then he says this. Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them out of the face of the earth. Then he says, turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about these terrible diseases. And then I love this one. This was smart of Moses. Talk about appealing to mercy. Remember your servant Abraham. And the covenant you made with him. That you would make his descendants as numerous as the stars of the heavens. So verse 14. So the Lord changed his mind. Does that just blow anybody else's mind? Y'all, that's the power of prayer. That's the the power of the friends of God. Come on. When you walk in intimacy with God, you can walk into such intimacy, and this freaks some people out, until you come to the place, you can change the mind of God. The whole Bible is filled with those kind of stories where God even said, I'm going to do this, and then somebody starts praying, and he says, okay. I know, I know, people, one time, I won't even go into what some people said about, I can't believe she said that. Go read your Bible. Just go read it for yourself. Okay, here's where I wrap. I'm trying. I've got to tell you this. Let me tell you this. This is what Jesus said. That, that, that concept of friendship with God carries all the way over into the New Testament. When Lindsay was gone, this verse, I had never seen it until she was gone. And then it was revealed to me. And this changed my life about my daughter. In Luke 11, verse 5, watch how it starts. Then Jesus teaching them more about prayer. Say prayer. Say it again. What was he teaching them about? So to teach them about prayer, he used this story. Listen to the story carefully. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight. Say midnight. midnight. That's important. Wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. Suppose he calls out to you from his bedroom. Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night. My family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need. Watch. Because of your shameless persistence. Then he goes on into, so ask and you will see, and seek and you'll find, and knock and it'll be open. Y'all, this story is amazing. Because Bob Sorge wrote a life-changing book that came to me when Lindsay was gone, transformed my life. This, this word became rhema. And what, what Bob did was he broke it down into today's, you know, culture. So I'm going to use Bob's illustration to tell you this story. Bob Sorge. Bob took that passage exactly as it was written and he just you know brought it to today and he said this okay there's three men we're going to call them Jim Dave and Rick Rick lives in St. Louis Jim and Dave both live in Dallas Rick is needing to go to Houston going to drive through Dallas going to Houston 
So Jim and Dave and Dallas are good friends, very close friends, very close friends. And that night, actually, Jim, Jim had dinner over at Dave's house, had a great dinner with the family, had a wonderful time talking, and um, finished eating. And, and uh, after they got through, you know, late, and Jim goes on home with his family. But Rick is driving through Dallas, and, and Rick and Jim are also friends. And Rick, while he's driving through Dallas, it's about midnight, and boy, Rick's getting tired. And he said, you know what? I remember Jim lives in Dallas. I'm going to stop at his house, and I'm just going to stay there tonight. So Rick stops at Jim's house, and it's late, but knocks on the door. And according, if you want to jump back into Jesus' time in Jewish culture, they were very hospitable people when they have guests. You know, the family is involved, the wife, the children, everybody is involved in unexpected guests or any guest. So Rick goes to Jim's house late, knocks on the door. You know, Jim's, oh, Rick, how are you doing? Oh, it's so good to see you, unexpected. And Rick begins to explain to Jim, you know, I'm driving through, I'm just too tired. Do you mind if I stay here? No, Lord, no, come on in, come on in. Y'all just make yourself at home. You got the whole family, wonderful. Y'all, let me get my wife up, honey. Y'all get up, everybody get up. We got company. Rick's, come on, Rick surprised us. Come on in. I know, isn't that wonderful? Come on, come on, y'all. And so he says, he sits down, and Rick sits down. Jim says, you know, Rick, y'all y'all hungry? You want me to get you anything to eat? Rick says, I'm starving. I ain't had nothing to eat all night. So Jim goes to, honey, come in here in the kitchen. Let's get them something to eat. We get in the kitchen, and, and Jim's wife looks at him, and she says, Jim, you know we ain't got nothing in this house to eat. That's why we ate at Dave's tonight. And so Jim's like, oh, I know it. He says, but you know what? I can run over to Dave's house because tonight after we finished dinner over there, I saw him put three loaves of bread in the pantry that was left over. So what I'm going to do, you get in there and entertain Rick. I'm going to run over to Dave's house, and I'm gonna, I'll be back. I'm going to borrow three loaves of bread. I'll be back. You just entertain him until I can get back. So what happens is while she's with Rick, Jim gets in the car, drives down the street over here to Dave's house. And it's a little after midnight, but, you know, that's okay because they're friends. Mm -hmm. So, Dave. Hey, Dave. Dave. Who is it? Who is it? Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave, it's Jim. It's Jim. I, I'm, I'm needing some help. I need you to get up if you can. I, I need, I'm needing to borrow something. For heaven's sakes, Jim, do you know what time it is? I do, I do, Dave, and I hate that so bad. I know, I know how late it is, but listen, I've got a little emergency here. I'm needing to borrow three loaves of bread. I don't even know if I have any bread, Jim. Yeah, you do. Actually, tonight I saw you put three loaves in the pantry while we were there. Three loaves, that's all I need. I just need three loaves of that bread. Jim, I am in bed. It is late. You can come over in the morning. Jim, I, Dave, I don't need it in the morning. I'm needing it right now. I can go to the bakery in the morning. I'm needing you to get up right now and go in there and get in that pantry and give me three loaves of bread. Jim, I am telling you, you need to go home. Get off of my property. Now, the deal is, truth be known, when Dave, when Dave tells Jim to get off his property, things actually change a little bit because there are laws for this. And now then, what Jim's doing is called trespassing. And the truth is also that Dave has a right to call the police and have Jim removed from the property. But the thing also is, Jim knows that Dave is his friend. And they've got a long history together. So although Jim knows Dave could call the police, Jim also knows Dave ain't going to call the police because he got such a good history of their friendship. So you know what Jim does? He just keeps knocking. Hey, Dave. Dave. I got I to gotta need that bread. I got to have three loaves. Jim, go home. Oh, you've woken up the kids now. Get No kids. Oh, everything's fine. Oh, it's just Jim from coming over tonight. He's just needing to borrow something. No See, this is good. This is good. Because what happens is Jim also knows that if you get the kids woke up, it's going good for you because you can get some more stuff stirred up. And listen, the truth is when you've been praying about something and you're not hearing from God, it's like God's not answering your prayer. What you need to do is go get some of his other kids' intercessors stirred up with you because what happens is what happens? those kids are going to start saying, Daddy, who's at the door? And Dave's going to go, it's Jim. 
and they're going to go, what does he want? And he's going to say, he's wanting to borrow some bread. And the kids are going to say, daddy, give him the bread. Give him the bread. So when you get some intercessors praying with you, come on. The power of agreement says, God, give Karen the bread. So what you do? What do you do? What do you do when the door won't open and you've been praying and asking and asking? This is Jesus' idea. That didn't make this up. This is his story on how I want you to pray. Dave. 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 Dave, it's Jim. Dave, I tell you what, I ain't no hurry. I can sit right here. I can sit right here. Dave, I'm going to sit right here at this door until the sun comes up. I ain't going home until I get my bread. I know you've got the bread, and I need the bread, and I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stay right here. (laughs) <laughs> until I get what I've come for. Come on, come on. That's why God brought you tonight to tell you you can't give up praying. You got to keep praying. You got to keep believing till you get everything that God has promised you. Come on. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Come on. Who needs some bread? Who needs some bread? Come on. Anybody need bread? Anybody need bread? Come on tonight, I'm here from Alabama to give some bread. In the name of Jesus, come on. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody need bread. Somebody need bread. In Jesus' name, come on. We're going to believe for the bread. We're going to believe for the bread. We're going to believe for the bread. Anybody need bread? Come on. I'm almost done, but I got to give you the ending of my story. Would you just sit down and let me tell you the ending. Lindsay's almost home. Hang on. I'm going to tell you one more thing and we're done. Do you get that, y'all? If you don't remember nothing else from this girl from Alabama, remember, Jesus gave you permission To pray like that. Now, you don't pray like that with a part-time relationship with God. You don't pray like that when you've just got an occasional call on you when I need you relationship. No. Listen, God's not some Santa Claus or sugar daddy. He is God. Come on. And he is your father. And he wants a relationship with you. But when you have intimacy with God, then you have the privilege of being able, oh, come on. Even Jesus said, Jesus said, if he won't get up just because of friendship's sake, he said, he'll get up, watch, because of your shameless persistence. If you look up the meaning of that, it means because of just the gall. That's what the interpretation of that word means, gall. Just gall that says, I don't care what anybody thinks. I look like a fool, and I know I look like a fool. And I know people think I'm crazy, but I'm going to keep knocking. I'm not going to stop. I've got a word. I've got permission to stand at this door, and I'm not leaving the door till the door opens. Well, for time's sake, I wasn't going to tell you this, but I've got to tell you one thing that happened when she was gone. I was, I'd been contending for that bread for weeks for Lindsay. I had been praying my Lord and declaring that word. In fact, in my house, in my living room, I would go to the front porch, the door, the front door of my house. And I would literally take that scripture and I'd just say, I'd say, God, it's Karen. You said I could ask God and I'm asking for bread. God is Karen. Lord, I need three loaves for Lindsay. I need three loaves for her healing, her salvation, and her deliverance. I need three loaves for Lindsay, God. Give me the bread. Give me the bread. You said pray this way. You're the one that said I could. And here I am, God. Here I am, God. And months, and one night, I was at the ramp. She was still gone. And y'all, we were in worship. And in the middle of worship, the kids in the ramp, were a thousand kids in there worshiping. 
I'm on the platform in my own little place with Jesus just worshiping. I wasn't even thinking about that prayer. And all of a sudden, I went into a vision standing there. And suddenly, before me, I see a door. And I thought to myself, what is this door? I see it as clear as you're looking at me. All of a sudden, the door opened. And out from behind the door, just as you just saw, came two arms. And they handed me three loaves of bread. And I literally stood there and I went like this. I went, ah, are you giving me the bread? You're giving me the bread. And when I said that, that door opened wide. And when the door opened wide, I stepped inside the door. When I stepped in the door, I looked around and I realized whew, I was in a warehouse of nothing but bread. It was shelves of bread from the floor to a ceiling you cannot even comprehend. More bread than your mind can imagine. And I'm looking at these loaves of bread and I heard a voice speak to me and he said, you just want three? I said, no, God, no, God, I'll take the whole warehouse. I need the whole warehouse for a generation of other young people. God, give me the bread. Give me all the bread for kids, Lord, for young people everywhere. Give me the bread. Come on. Come on, don't ask a small thing of a big God. He didn't put a limit on what you can ask for. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody can just come to the piano. I want to tell you the ending of Lindsay's story. The ending of a beginning. It was... After two years of contending prayer, I don't have time to tell you all the stories tonight. By no means we'll be here till the morning of the promises and the words and all that happened and receiving the promises and just horrible. It, just, it was going from bad to worse. For two years, it seemed like the more I prayed, the worse it got. It got to a place with her that was unthinkable and unspeakable. It got to the place where I was contending that the divorce would not happen, fighting in the spirit realm, fighting against that. She had filed for divorce, and for some reason, the divorce just kept getting delayed. In fact, the attorneys told Casey, her husband, we've never seen anything like this. Why these things just keep getting delayed? Never seen anything like it. So I knew what was happening, and I kept praying for God to keep Casey's heart tender, that he could receive her back. Because I wasn't, I had a promise. I had a promise. Maybe tomorrow, I'll, if I have time, if I can, if the Lord lets me, I'll tell you about some of those promises and how they came, which is unreal. But I knew with my promises that I was to keep praying for this marriage. Even though she was going from relationship to relationship. It was beyond. It was beyond. And I'm seeking God for Casey that he can get through this, keep believing. It's been over. They've been actually separated now three years and three years. And I've been praying now for continuously claiming these promises and believing and fighting in the spirit, and standing and believing. And finally, in January, three years ago this month of 16, I just gotten in from Winter Ramp, big conference that we do every year at the end of the year. And I was exhausted the night I got in. I sat down on my couch. I was eating a sandwich, I remember. And when I sat down, my husband walked in. And he looked at me, and he had his phone in his hand. And he said, well, I've just heard from Casey. And Casey had fought with me in prayer and believed and stood. But at the text, Casey began to read the text that indicated Casey had just actually taken the kids to give them to Lindsay for the weekend because custody had already been settled and mediation done and all things divided. It was a nightmare. And 
Casey had just seen something that was unthinkable. So Rick looked at me and he goes, well, Casey's just text me. And Kate, Rick began to read me the text. And it just said, well, Casey said, for me, it's over. You know, it's time for me to move on. I'll never forget this night as long as I live. I put that sandwich down. I grabbed my car keys. And I went to my car. And I just started driving. I drove around for a while and cried as hard as I could cry. And the war with the promises was so intense. Because the war had turned not so much as much even with me and Lindsay. As really as much as God and me. I was so exhausted. Confused. Could not understand. Stand. And I remember pulling up in my car in this midnight sky. It was around midnight by this time. I was alone out there in the cold. And I remember sitting in my car, sitting at that steering wheel. And I remember I'd cried for so long till I could do. My prayer was down to nothing but a few words. And the only thing that would come out of my mouth was looking at the sky and just screaming, Why, God? Why? Except it didn't sound like that. It was more like, why, God? Why? 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 And where are you? Where are you, God? Where are you? I can quote what I said that night. I remember saying to him, I'm not asking you where you are because I'm angry with you. I'm asking you where you are because I believed you. I believed you. And I remember all of a sudden, I said to him some words that came out of my mouth. I remember I said, God, Jesus, you told Martha when Lazarus died, you told Martha that he would rise again. You told her that. I said, God, now tell me everything you've said to me. And when I said those words, something in the atmosphere shifted. The bowls of intercession. And when I said, if you do not tell me different, I will still believe what you have said. I heard the Holy Ghost. And he said, say out loud, Lindsay and Casey are getting back together. And I couldn't believe how deep it was in me. It was, in fact, to be honest, it sounded like this, literally. I went, Lindsay and Casey are getting back together. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost said, say it again. I said, Lindsay and Casey are getting back together. He said, say it again. I said, Lindsay and Casey are getting back together. Say it again. Lindsay and Casey are getting back together. Lindsay and Casey are getting back together. Give me that phone. Y'all, all of a sudden, I felt myself believe it. Oh, no. No, no, no. I felt myself know it. Oh. And I thought, I've got to tell somebody. But it was after midnight. My little best friend, Pam, my little prayer warrior, she'd stood with me the whole journey, two years, like nobody else had. And she's as crazy as me. And I thought, I can't even call Pam. Pam's in bed. Everybody's in bed. My Lauren's in bed. Everybody's asleep. I thought, so my phone was in my passenger seat of my car. So I just reached over there and grabbed my phone. And I just started pretend calling people. <laughs> hey, hey, I've got the best news in the world. Yeah, you won't believe it. Lindsay, in case you're getting back together. <laughs> I know it. I know it. Yeah, I got to go by. Hey, Lindsay, in case you're getting back together. I know we're beside ourselves. <laughs> yes, it's, I know it. It is true. I got to go by. I don't even know how many people I pretend called that night. I called person after person after person. Come on. I called them. I can tell you one thing. Oh, I can tell you one thing. The woman that drove out of that driveway that night and pulled into my house was a different woman than the one that came out. Oh, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew. It looked worse than ever. It was more impossible than it had ever been on the whole journey. In fact, the next morning, 
I didn't dare tell my husband about it because he was already worried about my mental condition. <laughs> so uh, I called Pam next morning early as I could. And I told Pam everything I just told you. I told her the whole thing that happened. And so Pam, she, she that, that week immediately, she started going, oh, Karen. So the next day, Pam would call me and she'd say, did you hear about the news? I'd say, Pam, I have. Can you believe this? She'd say, oh, it's a miracle. Nothing but a miracle. It's just nothing but God. Next day, Pam would call me again. Karen, you won't believe this. She said, this morning I was watching Good Morning America and Lindsay and Casey were on there giving their testimony. I said, I know it, Pam. I saw it too. Can you believe it? This is the truth. One morning, Pam, the next morning, Pam called me and she said, Karen, you, could you, did you see the, the New York Times bestseller list? I said, I did. She said, that book Lindsay wrote about her testimony, it's on the top of the news. I said, can you believe it? I did see it, Pam. Come on. Oh, oh. We did that every single day. Every single day that week. Some, some people would say we're just crazy women. I say we're just like our father. We're calling things that are not as though they were. Come on. Calling things that are not. Get up on your feet. Oh, calling things that are not as though they were. Do I need to tell you what happened? One week from the day I sat in that car and looked at that starry sky saying to him, if you don't tell me any different, I'm still going to believe. One week from the day, more possible, impossible than ever, I get a text from Lindsay. I'm coming over. Come on. I was thinking, Lord, what's this about? Been waiting over two years. Sometimes you, you're, you're almost afraid to hope because sometimes hope hurts. When you hoped and you got disappointed. And you put up a wall. But no, no, no. That's what the enemy's after is your hope. Because if you lose your hope, you lost your faith. Because faith is the substance. So I remember looking at that text. Watching that road for Lindsay's car. When I saw that little white car coming down the road. Come on, I felt like the prodigal son's father. When he saw his son coming afar off. She walks in the house and just says, I got to talk to you, mom. She sits down and she says, I don't know what happened to me this morning. She said, but I woke up. And I miss Casey. She said, I've just sent him this email, and she shoved me her phone. And I looked, picked it up, and she starts telling him, I've made the worst mistakes of my life. I don't deserve a second chance, but I'm asking you to give me one. Please forgive me. I want to come home. I'm telling you what. I watched with my own eyes God, just as the scales fall from, fell from Saul's eyes, and he turned to Paul. I watched God transform my daughter from darkness to light. From death to life. No wonder the prodigal son's father said, my son that was dead is now alive. Come on. My friend, you can't give up. You can't give up. Every prayer works. Every prayer is still working. Whether it's for your daddy, for your mother, for your sister, for your brother, for your husband, for your wife. Come on. It's for your son or your daughter. You just can't stop praying. You just can't stop praying. If you're believing the Lord tonight for a prodigal, come stand right down here. I want to pray over you. Would you just play for us right there? Lauren, come up here with me. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. I have received my daughter back to life. Lauren received her sister back home. God kept his word. Lindsay and Casey, their marriage was restored. The week the judge had agreed to sign the papers was the week she came home. So he never got to sign them. So it was never dissolved, just like God promised me. In the face of everything else telling me different, 
God's word prevailed over everybody else's. He restored their marriage and their love. They had a little boy, the son of their restoration. He's now two years old, just like God promised me when she was gone. He said, not only is she coming home, you're going to hold a son. He kept that promise too. Now they've started a church in Knoxville, Tennessee. They're pastoring there together. And that book Lindsay wrote, it, she did on her testimony. And Lord, I pray you do put it on the New York Times bestseller. Because the world needs to know what Jesus can do. Here's how I want us to pray tonight. There was one prayer strategy I want you to take home with you, and I did this often. It's out of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'd never seen this verse until I was interceding for Lindsay. And it says this. It says, God has chosen us to reconcile people back to him. In fact, to, to pray this, we're going to pray it right now. Let me just read the, let me read the verse out loud. I've got to quote it right. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. I'm looking at a group of intercessors. Give me a tissue. God has given us the task. Who did he give it to? That's right. This time say me. Who did he give the task to? Me. Yeah. He gave us that task, me and you, of reconciling people to God. He says here, so we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Then this is the one that got me about her and your children. It says, <clears throat> we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That's huge. God is making his appeal through us. That's what he's about to do right now. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. That's the word. The word also, he also says, my word will not return to me void. No, when, that's what Jesus used against the devil. The word, the word, when it's coming out of your mouth, it's not coming back void. No, I'm sitting up. I took that verse literally. And when I saw it, I began to say exactly if, if that means, what that means is God is going to call Lindsay home through me. So what I started doing, I started going out on my front porch and going, Lindsay, come back to God. She lived in a town over an hour away. It don't matter. There's no distance in the spirit realm. Your son may be in a bar tonight. Your daughter may be with a relationship tonight, living with a man. It doesn't matter that they're not in this room. There's no distance. God's going to take the words out of your mouth right now, and he's going to go right where they are tonight. Come on. There's going to be something. Start stirring up in them tonight. To shout tonight. Shout tonight. Shout out and say today is the day of deliverance today right now is the day of deliverance oh come on lift your hands start praying in the holy spirit right now oh 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 Come on, pray, pray. Oh, oh. Come on, pray. God, go get them to the high God. Go get them to the high God. Oh, grip the heart, God. Oh, grip their heart, God. Change the heart, God. Open their eyes, God. Let the scales fall. Let the scales fall. Let the scales fall, God. Oh, let the la 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 la. And the Drug addiction broken. 
in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, my kosha. I feel to pray something specific right here. I feel to pray this over somebody's loved one. Their mind has been gripped by deception and rebellion. And I see another mind gripped in, in this addiction. This, it's like a generational curse, but it's just this addiction they've become dependent upon. In the name of Jesus, the blood is greater than the addiction. The blood is greater than the... In the name of Jesus, I declare, loose him and let him go. Loose her and let her go. Loose her. Loose him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on. Agree with me. Agree with me. In Jesus' name. Loose their mind. Loose their mind. We declare the addiction is broken. It has to submit and bow to the power of the name of Jesus. The the one that is bound by the deception of perversion. They have lost their identity as who they are. Come on. Even sexually, they've lost their identity as who God has called them to be. Come on. You and I agree right now. Their identity is restored. Come on. That spirit of Jezebel is not greater than the blood of Jesus, the power of God that has caused them confusion. Lord, I declare that spirit broken in their life by the blood of Jesus and the power of your name, the power of your word. Loose him and let him go. Loose her. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. that spirit in the name of Jesus I just want to speak these words be not deceived God is not mocked God is not mocked God is not mocked his name is greater his blood is stronger his word is more true come on love me I I declare right now from the gavel of heaven in the name of Jesus right here the word of God is the final answer come on The Word of God is the final answer. The Word of God is the final answer. The Word of God is the final answer. In Jesus' name. I want you to agree with me for this. Stretch your hand toward mine as a point of agreement. I declare that every spirit of and, and wrong influence over their life, every wrong relationship is broken. Every wrong influence I declare, may the mouth of them that speak lies be stopped. No, no, not my. Oh, oh my. Mm. Lord, even the, that there's a particular voice that they're listening to. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a stronger. There's, a, there's one. There's a, there's a lot of voices they're listening to, but there's one that's stronger. So in the name of Jesus, ha. Huh? <laughs> Until the stronger man comes, I give you praise, Jesus. You are the strongest. You are the greater. Till the greater one comes, you are the greater one. You have come right now to declare in the name of Jesus that we are stripping that enemy of his belongings. I declare over you right now the captive of the warrior will be released. The plunder of the tyrant will be retrieved. I will fight those that fight you and save your children. Shout hallelujah. I want you to shout this word. One, I want you to shout the word just broken. And, and when you say this word, I want you to look at that chain or that voice, that that deception is going to break. Jesus said, you power, loose, bind, right? We're going to declare the word. Look at that thing, that spirit of deception control. It's going to be broken in the name of Jesus on the count of three. Well, first of all, say this, say in the name of Jesus. Now shout the word broken. One, two, three, go. Broken! just happened this 
is the last thing I'm going to do. I'm going to give this back to Pastor Peter. This is it. Listen, we're going to decree it. When I tell you to shout this, we're going to call, I want you to call their name like I called Lindsay's name. Lindsay, come back to God. Lindsay, come back to God. But you call your child's name or your husband's name or whoever it is you're praying for. You identify. When Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, he called his name. Lazarus, come forth. You got to understand, this is not just you praying. Remember, God is making his appeal through you. This is the word of God that's calling them home. This is not just you by yourself, honey. You're co-laboring with God. And he's the greater one here. (laughs) Come on. Are you ready? I want you to, it doesn't matter where they are, the word is going to them right now. Lift up both hands, just as a point of the, just like the connection to heaven. Are you ready? I want you to see in the spirit what God is about to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, according to the power of your word that we believe right now, this word I hold in my hand and my heart. In the name of Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians 5 and 20, we declare this word. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Lindsay, come back to God. Come back to God. Come on. Tina, come back to God. Gina, come back to God. Tony, come back to God. Come back to God. Come back to God. Come on, don't stop. Come on, come on. Come on. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Thank you, Jesus. Now just give him praise. Right now, lift up your hearts and your hands. Just give him praise for what he's doing. Look up at the Lord right now. Look up at the Lord right now. Pastor, y'all go ahead and come. Our God is greater. Can you sing that? Our God is stronger. God, you are. Our God is awesome in power. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Do you believe that? Give God one more praise right now. Shout him. He's coming home. She's coming home. Come on. Come on. He's coming home. She's coming home. Come on. He's coming home. Come on. Look at somebody and tell them, say, did you hear about it? Did you hear about it? He came home. 